And a very good morning to you. It is that time of the month again. We are joined by our very special guest, our resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu from Life Medical Centers, is in the chair in the studio with us. Good morning to you, Clara. How are you? Yeah, going well. Thanks, Mick. Uh, another big topic to this morning in particular. It is, uh, it is a huge one, this one, uh, talking about Alzheimer's disease. So uh, a lot of people affected by that. It is quite significant news right across the world, particularly here in Australia. Uh, most of us have heard about Alzheimer's de- uh, disease, but what exactly is it? Yeah, so Alzheimer's disease is a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills, and then eventually the ability to even carry out the simplest of tasks. Um, so the disease is named after after a Dr. Alois Alzheimer's. And mm. in 1906, so this is a long time ago, um, Dr. Alzheimer noticed changes in the brain tissue of a woman who had died of an unusual mental illness. And her symptoms included memory loss, language problems, and unpredictable behavior. After she died, he examined her brain and found many abnormal clumps and tangled bundles of fibers. So this all might sound like what's going on in the brain there. So these plaques and tangles in the brain are still considered some of the main features of Alzheimer's disease. So what he discovered was quite significant. Mm -hmm. Um, Another feature of Alzheimer's is the loss of connection between nerve cells, also called neurons in the brain. So neurons transmit messages between different parts of the brain and from the brain to muscles and other organs in the body. Um, So many other complex brain changes are also thought to play a role in Alzheimer's disease. Now, this damage initially takes place in parts of the brain that involves memory, Mm -hmm. which is why that's the first thing that's affected and the first thing that most people notice or family members notice as the symptoms. Um, And then later it affects areas in the cerebral cortex, so things that are responsible for language, reasoning, social behaviour, um, and of course, as the disease progress, we see that many other areas of the brain are also damaged. Yeah, so it is kind of a, a gradual progression into the more serious side of the disease, isn't it, really? Yeah, absolutely. So who does it mostly affect? Yeah, so look, anyone can develop um, Alzheimer's disease, but it is more common in older age. So genetics, lifestyle and health factors um, you know, can be associated with an increased risk of developing it. In a few cases, Alzheimer's disease is inherited, so it's caused by a genetic mutation. So we talked about genetic mutations before. Um, and so this particular form is called familial Alzheimer's disease, um, with symptoms occurring at a younger age. So sometimes people in their 50s can start developing symptoms in this particular form of Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Now, how does it differ from something like dementia, or are they the same thing? So, good question. Dementia is a term for several diseases that affect memory, thinking, and the ability to perform daily tasks. Um, Alzheimer's disease is one of them. So, you know, the illnesses tend to get worse over time. As we said, mainly affects older people, but not all people will get it as they age. Um, And Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia amongst older people. So, if you can imagine it, Dementia is like the umbrella term covering Alzheimer's as well as other forms of neurological diseases that can affect your thinking and cognitive function. Now, what are some of the current stats around Alzheimer's here in Australia? Yeah, so in 2022, so that's last year, it was estimated by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare that there were 401,300 Let's start again. 401,300 Australians living with dementia. So based on these estimates, this is equivalent to 15 people with dementia per 1,000 Australians. So, you know, it's it's a significant number. Um, And that can increase to 84 people with dementia per 1,000 Australians age 65 and over. So, you know, once you hit the age of 65, it becomes a lot more prevalent. Um, And then nearly two thirds of Australians with dementia are women. Wow. So that's also interesting. Um, And with an aging and growing population, it is predicted that the number of Australians with dementia will more than double by 2058. And so, you know, you're getting numbers that's like close to 850,000. Yeah, that's quite amazing. Now, what are some of the more common signs and symptoms? Yeah, so I get asked this a lot because often people do come in and, you know, they're really worried that their loved one is starting to develop dementia. So 
the common things that I get asked about or get presented to me, as well as, you know, obviously the most common symptoms are um, persistent and frequent short-term memory loss, especially recalling recent events. Mm -hmm. So it's more about recent events than past events because they're stored in two different places. Um, repeatedly saying the same thing, um, vagueness in everyday conversation, change to plan, problem solve, organize and think logically. So that's actually a higher brain function. Yeah. Um, taking longer to do routine tasks. Um, language and comprehension difficulty. So difficulty finding the right words. So I think like a lot of our patients can, oh, sorry, your listeners can resonate with that. Sure. Um, increasing or disorientation in time, place and person. Um, problems in becoming motivated in initiating tasks. So tend to be a lot of just sitting around, not quite knowing what to do, sure. as well as changes in behavior, personality and mood as the disease progresses. So someone experiencing symptoms may not be able to recognize any changes in themselves. More often than not, it's a family member or a friend or someone um, you know, who, who close to them who will observe a change in that person. Um, and of course, the symptoms can vary as the condition progress because different areas of the brain are affected. So not everyone will experience those symptoms that I've just listed off. Sure. Um, you know, some people may have one particular set of symptoms, other people different set of symptoms, and a person's ability may fluctuate from day to day or even within the same day. Um, and of course, we know that as with lots of other illnesses, it can also, symptoms can worsen in times of stress or fatigue or, you know, if they've got some other kind of physical illness. Yeah, definitely some points to remember there. We are joined this morning by our resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu is in. We are talking about Alzheimer's disease. We'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Joined by our resident medico this morning, Dr. Clara Chu is in. We are talking about the uh, the huge topic of Alzheimer's disease this morning. Now, uh, Clara, we were already talking about it a little bit there beforehand, but uh, want to ask you this: How is it detected and diagnosed? This is a tricky one because there's currently no single test to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. So, a diagnosis is usually made after careful clinical um, consultation, mm -hmm. usually with a specialist. So the assessment might include, you know, a detailed medical history, a physical examination. We obviously want to do blood tests and urine tests to just rule out other reasons for, sure. for this, um, you know, the particular set of symptoms that the person might be coming in with. Um, sometimes a psychiatric assessment is done um, and neuropsychological testing to uh, assess someone's memory and thinking mm -hmm. um, is also done. And then, you know, we can also get the help of brain scans and sure. things like that to give us a bit more clue. Now, after eliminating other causes, that's when we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And it's important to have an early and accurate diagnosis to determine whether symptoms um, that are being investigated are caused by Alzheimer's or by something else that might require its own special set of specific treatment. Sure. Now, speaking of treatments, uh, what are the current treatments available? So... At the moment, there is no actual cure for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and while there are a few medications that might be around, there's no treatment that can actually stop the condition from progressing. So all we can do is kind of slow it down. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we can prescribe medications that can slow down the decline in memory and thinking abilities. Um, and then we can also prescribe drugs for secondary symptoms like agitation, depression, or to improve sleep, because those things can sometimes be quite troubling sure. um, to patients with um, Alzheimer's disease. And then we've also got non-drug therapies, which we love talking about, um, you know, so staying active, staying socially connected, managing stress, like those things can also be really helpful. Um, we sometimes refer people, you know, to a counsellor or a psychologist to help manage um, changes in their behaviour and their mood. We can refer people to an occupational therapist yep. who might assess the home environment to see if there's ways to help make day-to-day -day function at home a bit easier. Um, and in all stages of Alzheimer's, treatment and support services are available to reduce the impact of the symptoms and make sure that the quality of life remains as good as it can be for everyone who's living with the condition. Sure. Now, what should you do if you suspect that uh, maybe yourself or someone close to you has Alzheimer's? Great question. I would suggest visiting your GP who can do some base, baseline blood tests and we can also administer some simple memory tests in mm -hmm. the office 
to see if there's any other causes for the symptoms and also to, you know, confirm your concerns. Because sometimes, you know, we end up doing like that, um, a mini memory test in the office. Right. And we find that the person actually, you know, has quite a good memory yeah. and that there are yeah. no issues, right? Um, so, you know, just because someone brings someone else in and thinks they've got a memory problem, yeah. we really should suss that out with something that's a bit more objective. Sure. Um, and then your GP might send you or your loved one to a neurologist or a geriatrician to get a more thorough assessment yeah. and to confirm the diagnosis. And I guess the thing too to, to remember about that is, you know, I think – Anyway, as we get older, we've lived a lot more life. So, you know, I guess the memories do become a little bit more vague over time and things naturally slow down within the brain and within the body. So mm. somebody may be thinking, oh, could that be a sign? Could that be a symptom? Not too sure. But like I say, just get along to your GP, get yourself checked out and uh, and probably don't worry about it too much unless you obviously see some major things going on yeah that's right yeah now is it a, uh, a genetic disease or do lifestyle factors contribute to alzheimer's yeah so earlier we mentioned that there's people with this familial sure. alzheimer's disease um, and really apart from those people it's not really known why some people develop alzheimer's and other people don't um, so you know health and lifestyle factors may contribute to the development of alzheimer's disease so you know these are all the things that we've often talked about um, here with you, Mick, you yep. know, yep. Uh, physical inactivity, lack of mental exercise, being socially isolated, smoking, drinking, um, being overweight or obese, having diabetes, having high cholesterol, having high blood pressure, having depression. So they're all kind of like known risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease. Sure. Um, at, but my take home for today um, in terms of, you know, minimizing your risk of developing Alzheimer's would be get moving, get thinking, get connected. Yeah. So bear with me, we'll go through those. Um, so get moving is an obvious one, right? It helps with weight loss, um, you know, can prevent diabetes, can improve your blood pressure and, you know, it can improve your mood, right? Yeah. So getting, you know, just moving around um, sure. is super important. Um, get thinking. So, you know, engage in mental activity. So whether that be like doing puzzles, playing board games, playing a musical instrument, um, or even bushwalking. So, you know, apparently the irregular terrain of bushwalking makes our brain and body work harder and can keep us mentally fit. So mm. I love that one. That's kind of like a two-in-one activity. You know, yep. you're getting physically fit or even three-in-one, you know, you're physically um, work, moving yourself, your, your brain's getting a bit of a workout and you're outdoors. Yeah, that's a really good point, that one. So you're really getting your mind out of, I guess, very familiar patterns that seem to form ruts almost in, in yeah. the neurology of the brain, isn't it? You yep. want to get out of that to, I guess, form new pathways and things. To Yeah, so that's a great one, that one. Yeah, so, you know, if we keep the brain active, then you're not going to lose the function. Sure. So, you know, that old saying, you know, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Right. And that's very true for brain function. Yep. Um, you know, there was a podcast that I listened to with a neuroscientist um, and his uh, his kind of idea was that, the more of a buffer you can build up as a younger person, right? you know, even if you do lose a little bit as an older person, you've just got more memory to work with, right? you know? So a person who is really hard at building up their mental capacity as a younger person yeah. would be functioning at a higher level than someone who's got, you know, maybe a slightly lower mental capacity. Yeah. And so if both people lose 10%, well, the one who's got the higher mental capacity at, from a younger age is going to win. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and we'll move on. Getting connected. So social isolation is becoming more and more common these days. Um, and the antidote to that is to get socially connected with others. So, mm. you know, the obvious one is friends and family. But even if people don't have family and, f family and friends who are nearby – um, there are organizations that are always got open doors. Churches have open doors, yep. most, you know, pretty much everywhere. Rotary, Men's Shed, um, or, you know, events like Park Run, yep. um, you know, which is a, a free community event. There's a couple of them on the coast. Um, and so, you know, that's, they're great opportunities to just meet other people, connect with other people. Um, and at this point, I want to give volunteering a special mention as well, because when you're volunteering, not only are you sharing your time and your energy, there's also the benefit of bringing meaning and purpose to your life um, while increasing your self-esteem and your well-being. So if you want to do something that's kind of good for your brain, good for your heart and soul, give volunteering a go. 
Absolutely. One of the things that I heard as well that it was that was great as a as a therapy for this, I guess, like you said, even building that buffer when you're younger is to learn another language. Yeah, that's right. That's another great one. Because that yep. really opens up brand new. It, it, it does cause the brain to form all these brand new neural pathways that were there before. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. Trying to learn all these new things. So it's it's a great way to, to, to I guess, stave off Alzheimer's in, in a way, but also to, again, increase your mental capacity. So yeah. that would be a, that is a huge one. Now, what support is available for people living with Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is um, such a big issue in our community that when I was researching this, there were quite a number of organisations that I found that were available to help people diagnosed with Alzheimer's or their carers. So here are a few for um, for our listeners. So there's a national dementia hotline Mm -hmm. um, or helpline. So, you know, you can definitely look that up and just give them a call. Um, There's an organization called Cognitive Dementia and Memory Service. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they can offer some help as well. Other ones include Dementia Support Australia and Dementia Australia, so two separate organizations. Um, And on the coast, more closer to home, we've got Central Coast Dementia Advisory Group and Central Coast Dementia Alliance. And then there's also respite care and short-term stay on a more practical note that we can access through um, the Central Health Local Health District um, Carer Support Unit. And then, of course, people often then start thinking about um, care and living arrangements. Sure. And that's where ACAT, the Age Care Assessment Team, can come in. So it's not an exhaustive list. Like there's so many more resources out there, but that's probably a good starting point. There you go. Our resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu, in this morning, another fascinating topic there talking about Alzheimer's de- disease. Now, again, uh, some of the, uh, the, the help groups there that uh, Clara has mentioned, get onto them if you suspect that yourself or even a loved one may be uh, exhibiting some of the early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Get onto it quickly, more quickly than, than later is probably a better thing to do. Dr. Clara, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll be seeing you next month again with another really fascinating health, health topic to, uh, to get into. Stay with us. We've got some more great stuff still to come. This is Rima Brecky.